uh, welcome everyone to this uh, asia pacific glaucoma society symposium on congenital glaucoma i would like to thank the all india ophthalmic society for this kind invitation so today's uh, symposium is being chaired by dr sk fang from malaysia he is the president elect of the asia pacific glaucoma society he has also been the past president of the malaysian society of ophthalmology and is also the regional secretary for the asia pacific academy of ophthalmology so i hand over to dr sk fang to introduce the asia pacific glaucoma society and then initiate this symposium so over to dr sk please thank you thank you tanush and welcome to all the speakers uh, let me share my screen uh, i will just share a few slides uh, regarding the asia pacific glaucoma society can you see my screen Yes. Yes. yes, 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 we do. So the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society, uh, these are some of the benefits and we would like to encourage uh, all of you to join our society. Uh, we do have uh, Asia Pacific Glaucoma guidelines and uh, we, on the website, we do have now a lot of educational resources. And these are the members benefits, which I would not go through in detail. I would just like to highlight uh, the APGS online education platform, which is actually currently being uh, held. Uh, the, the chair in, uh, of this platform is uh, Professor Tanush Dada. And we do have a lot of uh, video assisted uh, skill transfer that you can uh, uh, obtain from this uh, website. And uh, this is the QR code and uh, our email uh, address and website address. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia uh, next year from 5th to 7th August for the Asia Pacific uh, Glaucoma Cong Congress. Uh, and uh, this will be hopefully uh, held face to face or uh, depending on the situation might be hybrid. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce all the speakers of this joint uh, symposium between the AIOS and APGS. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Srisha Sentil uh, giving us a lecture on decision on what type of surgery and special situation for uh, congenital glaucoma. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Ho Ching Ling from uh, Singapore talking about goniotomy. Uh, Dr. Vijaya Lingam uh, from uh, Chennai, India, talking about trabeculectomy and with or without the trabeculectomy. Uh, Visni from uh, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, will be talking to us on use of lasers in childhood glaucoma. Uh, Professor Zulan Chang from China, from Guangzhou, China, will be talking to us on GET for con congenital glaucoma and for uh, finally, uh, Professor Susmita Koshik from India will be talking to us on post-operative management of congenital glaucoma. We will take uh, questions and answer at the end of all the recorded uh, presentation. Uh, do enjoy the presentation. Kardia. Is audio-visual team here, please? Dr. Sirisha, you are sharing your slide? Yeah. And after this, the audio-visual team will uh, play the recorded lecture. Okay. Are my uh, slides visible? Yes. Make it slideshow, yes. Yes. All right. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Tanuj and uh, AOS and APGC for the invitation. So this is, uh, we know that congenital glaucoma presents in a huge variety and uh, they present uh, with a mild problem to a very severe problem. And we deal with several of these situations and especially when it comes to India and uh, some parts of uh, 
Middle East, we do have a lot of patients with uh, difficult diseases who come. So there are several choices for the treatment of pediatric glaucoma, uh, starting from the angle-based surgeries to the subconjunctival surgeries and the implant surgeries, and in some situations, also the laser procedures. So the common question that is asked is, how do you choose? I think the answer to this is not simple. It is very complex, and we all go by a case-based situation. On an individual basis, we choose. It depends on the type of glaucoma, depends upon the age of the child uh, that presents with the disease, and also associated ocular comorbidities. What is unique in infants is that these eyes are large. Majority of them have very hazy corneas. Because the eyeball becomes large and buophthalmic, they also have a significant amount of scleral thinning that could be localized or generalized, distorting the angle and uh, distorting the anatomy of the limbus as well as the eye itself. And several of them can also have distorted anterior segments. We know that medical treatment has a very limited role, except in certain types of secondary glaucomas because of the significant angle anomaly. And this basically is a surgical disease. Surgery is the mainstay of treatment and the definitive treatment. First surgery is always the best choice. So one has to choose a good surgery or a best surgery in that person's hands so that whatever success we achieve, it needs to last long because children have a very long life to go. So corneal clarity plays a very important role in these eyes. So operating children with congenital glaucoma is quite challenging and I, it would always be advisable for trained specialists with uh, higher volume centers who would operate because they have definitely greater experience in handling these children. Not just the surgery but post-operative management whether it is in terms of amblyopia management or additional procedures that some of these eyes would require like a keratoplasty and uh, sometimes uh, even the vitroretinal surgeries would be possible if they are in a tertiary care center. Frequent follow-ups as well as need for examination under anesthesia and rehabilitation both for amblyopia as well as visual rehabilitation has to be an integral part. So once in a while, if somebody needs to operate, I think they need to really think they could assess and help in post-operative management, but surgeries should be a choice that should be uh, possibly given to people who have a greater uh, chance of seeing them or operating similar type of cases. So the types of glaucomas that present when the child is very young is essentially primary congenital glaucoma, which is the major chunk. Also those glaucomas with anterior segment anomalies and acquired certain acquired diseases also present quite early in age. So like I said, the ocular changes of corneal clarity, the corneal diameter and the anterior segment distortion. Sometimes you may also have subluxated lens, you may have iris tissues that are abnormal. So all of these play a very important role in choosing the type of surgery. Less than a month's age when the child presents versus the child presenting greater than one month until two years and greater than two years, because we know, especially in India, uh, congenital, we have children with congenital glaucoma. That means glaucoma present at birth, but children present to us. So the parents bring the children even beyond two or three years of age. So it's not uncommon for us to see, although it is a glaucoma that was present at birth, but they do present quite late. So conventionally we do angle-based procedures or a combined trabeculotomy with trabeculectomy. And if it fails, we go for repeat trabeculectomy or drainage implants and cyclophotopyrogulation. Angle-based surgeries, uh, usually when there are no other ocular anomalies, and the child is greater than a month and less than two years of old, they, they do well. And so when the corneal clarity is good, it, it should not be a problem at all. But very large corneas or presence of a corneal haze, it becomes difficult to do. Hazy corneas, one of the things that's very important is to identify what is behind this hazy cornea. So this is something that's very important because this could be a primary congenital glaucoma with a grade five corneal edema, or it could be an, an area that's presenting with a corneal haze or a severe anterior segment disease, or a congenital aphakia, or a Peters anomaly. So we don't know what is there behind the cornea. So it's always a good idea to try and evaluate them so that you can plan an appropriate procedure. At the same time, helps to prognosticate with the parents as well. 
So combined trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy is the common procedure that we perform because several of our children present with hazy corneas. Having said that, uh, some of these, at least because of the early presentation these days, we do see children who come with a little lesser, less severe disease. So we are able to do angle-based surgeries. You can see after the corneal, uh, after the trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy, some amount of corneal clearing, and you can see a, a dilated fixed pupil in this eye. So this child actually later on um, underwent uh, keratoplasty and is doing well. So like I said, uh, these children, because of the corneal haze that they have, even if the primary surgery is working well, sometimes after this additional procedure like a keratoplasty or some of them may require a cataract surgery, uh, the primary surgery may fail and one may require to do a repeat intervention. So we should be, uh, we should be vigilantly following them up because they, they do require multiple procedures as time goes by. Glaucoma drainage devices, we generally avoid doing them as a primary procedure in primary congenital glaucoma, but in certain situations where uh, they, they, uh, they are secondary type of glaucomas, where they are difficult anterior segments to manage, in such situations, they are also used as primary procedures. Both valved and non-valved implants are used. Again, how do you choose them is a choice based on the surgeon's experience, availability of the implant, plus other factors that are there. But what is important is any type of surgery that is done, meticulous surgery and meticulous follow-up is extremely important. And choosing the surgery that is, uh, that is uh, comfortable for that surgeon or uh, has expertise for that surgeon, I think is very, very important. In some situations where there are difficult eyes, we cannot manage uh, an intraocular procedure or a non-seeing eye where you want to avoid having the uh, further enlargement or buphthalmos, a transcleral cyclophotopyrrhulation is a good choice. Some special situations. So this was a child who presented with a huge cornea, congenital glaucoma. Uh, when I took it up for a procedure, I was surprised to see that there was no pupil at all. So this child had a persistent pupillary membrane with pupillary block and enlarged corneal diameter. And you could see the Habs ray as well. So this child... I just did a pupilloplasty and, uh, and tried to do a sinucleolysis as much as possible. Underlying lens was crystal clear and through that on table, we could do a, a fundus evaluation and there was a 0.6 cupping. And since the cupping was not much, although the eye, la, eyeball was enlarged, just a pupilloplasty was sufficient and this child is doing well. So this was another such child with a syndrome a clippel trinani syndrome, who presented with a huge eyeball and multiple systemic anomalies, similar kind of presentation with pupillary block. And uh, so basically there is no pupil at all. And when I did the pupilloplasty, I realized that there was a persistent uh, tunica vasculosa lentis that was actually a, with a persistent pupillary membrane that was causing a pupillary block. So sometimes we should be uh, vigilant about what the mechanism is and looking at the anterior segment, find out uh, can you do a procedure that can take care of the problem and not uh, do a routine trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy for these patients? Uh, sometimes it could be just a vitreous blocking the pupil and that has to be evaluated. So these people, people, if you see, there's some amount of peaking. So all I had to do was a little bit of an anterior vitrectomy and that could take care of the uh, uh, pupillary block and a little bit and, and, and that, that, that could take care of the uh, glaucoma as well. Sometimes spherophakia also can present with subluxated lens and high IOP. In situations like that, doing a lensectomy would be necessary. So to summarize, there are several options for the management of uh, congenital glaucoma. Choose the best surgery as the first surgery based on the surgeon's expertise. And what is very important is follow-up care and uh, evaluation during the follow-up time is very, very important. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sirisha. So before we move on to the next presentation, Dr. Sirisha, there is one question for you. That in congenital glaucoma, you often have an anterior insertion of the iris. So when you're doing a goniotomy, how are you sure that you are at the right position and you are going into the canal of Schlem. So uh, Dr. Tanu, that is a question that all of us have. So I don't even know whether we are reaching the canal of Schlem or not, but what we know is that they do have an anterior insertion and possibly it's covering up the entire angle structures there. 
So when we go just above the iris root insertion and when we when we make the coniotomy opening, you see that the iris falls back, and the only proof for the pudding is that it works. So the iris falls back, and what we believe is that possibly it it exposes the underlying angle structures, and that will help for the intraocular pressure control. Okay. So in fact, the recently our data that we had collected over the past couple of years. Uh, we we see that close to in primary goniotomies, close to about 60 to 70 percent of them do well even at one year. In secondary goniotomies, that means the primary trab and trab has worked for three four years. After that, instead of doing a second repeat trabeculectomy, I tend to do a goniotomy, and for them, the qualified success with medications is about 50 percent at one year. Which okay. means even if you can avoid doing a second proceed second conjunctival procedure, even in 50 percent, I would be happy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srisha. It was an excellent presentation. So over to Dr. S.K. Fang for the next presentation. So the uh, team can put up the next uh, recorded presentation. Yeah. Dr. Ho Ching Lin from Singapore. Is, is anyone from the AV team here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have, please, sir. Please start the presentation which you have recorded. Sure, sure sir. Sure, sir. Good evening, Chairman, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the kind invitation to be part of this exciting virtual congress. And I'll be speaking on goniotomy for congenital glaucoma today. I have no financial interest relating to the topic. The visual prognosis of children. Good evening, Chairman, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the kind invitation to be part of this exciting virtual congress, and I'll be speaking on goniotomy for congenital glaucoma today. I have no financial interest relating to the topic. The visual prognosis. and trabeculotomy in the 1960s, which dramatically improved the outcomes. Indeed, angle surgeries proved to be the turning point in the management of this blinding childhood condition. Angle surgery is incisional surgery performed on the drainage angle of the eye, targeting the abnormal trabecular meshwork and inner wall of the Schrems canal, reducing resistance to outflow of aqueous. There are two main techniques, namely goniotomy and trabeculotomy. While goniotomy technique has remained largely the same, there has been modifications and advancement in trabeculotomy technique over time from the conventional app external method, first described with metal probes, to choices of technique now, including app internal approach and circumferential treatment, which will be covered later on in this symposium. Angle surgery is a preferred choice for congenital glaucoma with favorable prognostic factors. Besides very high success rates, also, it also carries lower risk of site-threatening complications compared to filtration surgeries, including hypotony and a lifelong risk of blab or device-related infections. If performed app internal, it also preserves the conjunctival for future surgery, important in the long lifespan of a child. In goniotomy, the trabecular measure is incised under direct gonioscopic view through the cornea. There are three keys to a successful outcome, and these are adequate assess, clear visibility of the angle, and anterior chamber maintenance. Assess can be challenging in ophthalmic eyes, and especially in those with small or narrow palpable apertures, such as in oriental eyes. To fit the goniotomy lens and assess the peripheral cornea, we need to have lenses in different sizes. And the lateral contortomy is also helpful to increase assess in some cases. Visibility may be improved by increasing cornea clarity with pre-operative IOP lowering medications, hypertonic saline, as well as creation of an epithelial window by removing cornea epithelium. With regards to AC maintenance, use of a tapered knife or 25 gauge needle without any prior incisions helps. Use of a needle mounted on viscoelastic enable reformation in case the AC is lost inadvertently. Filling the AC with viscoelastic and the use of an AC maintainer are alternative, alternative ways of maintaining AC but instilling fluid into these eyes can increase cornea haze and reduce visibility. It is also important that the assistant holding onto the eye do not place excessive pressure on or distort the eye. Maintenance of the AC post op by ensuring watertight closure of the corneal wounds in the child is advisable to prevent AC shallowing and PAS formation, which can limit outcome. 
each technique has its advantages and disadvantages. Goniotomy is my preferred procedure as this is least traumatic with the shortest operating time compared to trabeculotomy or filtration surgeries. It is precise with visualization of the angle and the incision. It is in conjunctival sparing, bladless, and repeatable for greater effect. However, the view is everything in goniotomy and thus requires corneal clarity and good gonioscopic technique, including positioning of the microscope relative to the patient's head and eye. Another disadvantage is that the assistant is needed, an assistant is needed to help rotate the eye so that a greater extent of the angle can be treated. It is generally recognized that for comparable degrees of disease severity, both goniotomy and conventional trabeculotomy offer similarly high rates of success of between 70 to 90% after multiple procedures. I'm sorry, uh, multiple procedures in favorable cases of primary congenital glaucoma. However, the success rates of goniotomy is much lower in most secondary glaucomas associated with ocular and or systemic anomalies and in acquired glaucomas with the exception of a few specific conditions with angle pathology similar to that of primary congenital glaucoma, such as glaucoma in congenital rubella, infantile stitch ribble glaucoma, and favorable cases of glaucoma secondary to chronic childhood uveitis. Adverse prognostic factors for goniotomy and angle surgery in general include newborn glaucoma and those with later presentation over two years of age. Very enlarged ocular dimension, which is a measure of structural damage over time. Previous intraocular surgeries, as well as positive family history indicating more severe phenotypes are also adverse prognostic factors for the success of angle surgery. I would like to talk a bit about goniotomy in glaucoma complicating chronic childhood uveitis, as this is probably the only form of acquired glaucoma that goniotomy is particularly effective for, especially in the absence of poor prognostic factors. Study have shown that studies have shown that the efficacy and safety of angle surgery, including trabeculotomy and goniotomy in childhood uveitic glaucoma. The avoidance of a blood or drainage device greatly reduced risk of long-term complications in the extended lifespan of these children, especially site-threatening infections and eventual hypotony, as many of these eyes have aqueous hyposecretion over time. This study was published 17 years ago on goniotomy in children with chronic uveitis in Boston, Massachusetts, in the practice of Prof. Dave Walton. It's a retrospective review of 54 goniotomy in 40 eyes with uveitic glaucoma refractory, refractory to maximal medical therapy. One or more standard goniotomy was performed in these eyes with controlled uveitis at the time of surgery. Potential risk factors were analyzed against the outcomes in terms of post-op IOP and medication use. The patients in these studies were predominantly female. Three quarters of juvenile idiopathic arthritis associated uveitis with a mean onset of uveitis at four and a half years and mean age of surgery at 10 years. Three quarters were phakic and a quarter were aphakic due to lens extraction for secondary, secondary, cataract, secondary or congenital cataracts. A strength of this study was that the mean follow-up duration of more than, was very long at more than eight years. Goniotomy was found to be effective and safe in childhood uveitic glaucoma in this study, and we believe should be considered the surgical procedure of choice in favorable eyes. However, success rate is significantly limited by older age at the time of surgery, longer duration of glaucoma, as those with successful outcome, in those with successful outcome, the mean duration was 1.7 years versus 5.4 years in eyes which failed goniotomy. A fake year. Overall success rate in fake eye was 86%, while those in a fake eye was 36%. Multiple previous intraocular surgeries also affect the outcome in that those with no surgery had 87 success, 87 percent success rate versus zero percent success in those with more than three prior surgeries. Extensive PS pre-op of more than six hours were all failures, whereas those with no PAS had success rate of 82 percent overall. Surgical outcome in this study appears to be unaffected by gender, onset and duration of uveitis, uveitic etiology, severity of post-op high femur, less severe angle anomalies, steroid and glaucoma medication use. This is a video of one of my first goniotomies about 20 years ago, and my technique has essentially remained unchanged. It's a, in an ideal case, there will be a breathtaking view of the angle with a Barkins goniotomy such as this. In this case, I used a 25 gauge needle to enter the anterior chamber without injecting any fluid or viscoelastics. 
The angle is incised in between the tip of the iris insertion and the Schwabe's line. An assistant sitting opposite holding onto the superior and inferior recti insertions with pre-placed locking forceps rotates the eye clockwise and anti-clockwise with my instructions so that up to five to six clock hours of the angles can be treated with a single entry. In this patient, part of the cornea epithelium has, removed, have, has been removed, as you can see here. I think on, on this, it, it's just a small window is sufficient actually for a good view of the angle. Another eye of primary congenital glaucoma where part of the epithelium has been removed to allow a fair view of the angle. In this case, the cornea is still slightly hazy due to stromal edema, but you can see the falling back of the iris as the goniotomy cleft is created. In this bothelmic eyes, the interior chamber is invariably deep, allowing quite a lot of space for maneuvering within the AC without losing the chamber, if one is careful not to distort the cornea or the wound. This is a corneotomy for a nine-year-old with a childhood uveitis. Uh, this, as you can see, unlike in primary congenital glaucoma, the eye will look, the angle actually looks quite crowded and narrow, but actually this is a normal, normal anatomy of a child with, uh, with a, of a child's anterior chamber. Usually the cornea is clear in uveitic glaucoma, and with the assistant help, I can treat up to five to six clock hours of the angle. As you can see in this case, but the anterior chamber looks a lot smaller. And so actually it's, it's, more, it's easier to lose the chamber and the meticulous technique is actually important. In those who are unfamiliar with the gonioscopy view as well as technique, perhaps you know, pre-filling pre the anterior chamber with uh, viscoelastic may help to maintain the AC. Okay, so in this, in this video, I'm going to show a less than ideal case. This is an eye of an 11 year old with uveitic glaucoma and shallow anterior chamber, high IOP of 48 millimeters mercury despite maximal medications. As you can see, someone has inadvertently dilated the pupil as well preoperatively, completely exposing the crystalline lens. I decided in this case to create a corneal tunnel and instill myostat to constrict the pupil and viscoelastic to deepen the AC to protect the lens. While the cornea looks grossly clear preoperatively, instilling the viscoelastic even without overfilling results in a very diffuse haze. In this case, you can still see the creation of the cleft with falling back of the iris, but my incision is slower and much more tentative due to the hazy view. The assistant is rotating the eye slowly and I was able to treat about five clock hours. Fortunately, this patient did well post-operatively and IOP fell to 10 millimeters of mercury on no medication at one month post-op. This is a gonio photo of a functioning goniotomy cleft many years after a successful goniotomy for primary congenital glaucoma. This patient has IOP in the low teens without any glaucoma medications. In conclusion, goniotomy has very good outcomes and have restored the test of time as initial procedure of choice for primary congenital glaucoma. Success depends on patient selection, extent of angle treated, avoidance of complication, as well as diligent amyotropia and amblyopic treatment. Angle surgery requires meticulous attention to details, considerable skills and experience. And the choice between the two main techniques largely depends on corneal clarity, surgeon preference, and experience. Corneotomy for congenital glaucoma should be performed by trained surgeons in centers with expertise and safe childhood anesthesia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ho. Uh, now I would like to welcome uh, Professor Visani Tansdisevi to talk to us on use of laser in childhood glaucoma. Uh, is uh, recorded video? Or uh, uh, it's live, yes. I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, is that there? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, all right, okay, here we go. 
Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Miss Nee from uh, Bangkok, Thailand. Well, the topic I'm going to talk today is about the uses of laser in children glaucoma. Um, oops. Sorry, it does not moving. Okay, then. Well, I have no financial dis I, I don't have financial disclosure. Um, childhood glaucoma has been classified into many and recently Ah, uh, what is that? Okay, well, the shared glaucoma has been recently classified, uh, newly classified into many forms, uh, such as a glaucoma associated with other diseases, uh, ocular or systemic diseases, um, primary congenital, and the glaucoma suspect, and the GOAG sort of. So, but the prevalence depends on, you know, geographical areas in some terms. So let me show you some characteristic of periodic glaucoma in our institutes. Um, after 10 years uh, data collection, more than 400 patients, we found that more than 50% of us uh, shows uh, in terms of the secondary glaucoma rather than primary congenital, which is the primary congenital, uh, just only 20%, and the glaucoma suspect because of uh, they are referred to as just only 20% as well. And when you compare our studies with other studies uh, from other areas of the world, we found that you know, the primary congenital in our studies are much lower than other studies. Periodic glaucoma, as mentioned earlier, is a surgical case of force. The angle surgery is the procedure of choice, but particularly in primary congenital. Otherwise, we have to go on with trabeculectomy or the GDD in the, in the selected cases. Anyway, the drawback of the types of the penetrating glaucoma surgery in young children is the risk of devastating complications, particularly the scleroidal diffusion or subcleroidal hemorrhage in, in, in cases that particularly uh, for the risk of hypotony. And cases that need uh, multiple post-op examinations, of course, those, those with the uh, uh, surgical um, interventions, uh, post-op interventions, it's uh, uh, always needed. And they need to be under the general anesthesia. And uh, of course, we will put our little children uh, to the risk of anesthesia-related complication too. So that's why some clinicians prefer not to intervene at all in cases with a poor prognosis or the eyes anomalies that significantly increase the risk of surgical complications. Laser is another treatment modality to glaucoma and has about, you know, what, how, how well it, it works in the, how well it works in the, in children glaucoma. There are diet TCP, endoscopic CP, and recently launched the micropulse TCP. So let's take a look at it. The dial TCP is something that we find that are very, uh, you know, least invasive and uh, no, it's not that least, but because it can cause a painful during, painful eye during, during the procedure. So the, our patients need to be under the anesthesia again, but the outcome of this from the study, uh, the dial TCP can decrease the RP in the, you know, little eye comes down to 33%, but most of the time they need to be retreated more than once. The overall success rate, whether in younger or older subgroups, did not differ, and the overall success uh, was about just only 50 percent. This is another study that shows that you know the IP can be sustained after the laser uh, at the favorable at the favorable level up to 60 percent over one year after you know after the laser. But they also show that the cases up to 13%, that, that is no effect at all. And particularly if you look at the, you know, the survival curve after 24 months or two years after the laser, this, effective, this effectiveness has been uh, declined drastically. And again, if you look at this study that showed, uh, you know, the type of the fake glaucoma can uh, do well with the, we do better with the laser treatment than other types of the uh, of the congenital glaucoma. However, this uh, study also show again about thirteen percent that fails to control after after six months. Sorry, before six months after the surgery, after the laser surgery. The ECP is something that uh, can help that on the direct visualization of the steroid processes, and uh, how's about that? 
success rate. It's just only 53% in, uh, in this study. Uh, this study was done in a fake and pseudo fake guy. Uh, just, just, like, just like other studies, after 500 days post laser, you can see it's nearly, uh, nearly two years, just only a year and a half that you know, the effectiveness of the laser declined drastically. And when comparison of the effectiveness of the transcoro CP and the ECP, it was found that if you increase the number of procedures more than more than two, perhaps you can uh, have the final success rate, you know, uh, increase up to sixty to nearly seventy percent, and the reduction in IP can uh, finally up to thirty percent in both in, in, in both procedures. The Microplus TCP is recently launched and uh, it works by decreasing the production of the aqueous and uh, probably enhance the GVO score outflow. Um, in, in this study, they recruited the patients with the uh, adult patients and uh, pediatric patients all together and they found that the, uh, in the adult patients may, might do better with the, micro, with the micropulse TCP rather than in the pediatric eyes. But please be noted that eight out of nine of childhood glaucoma here were anomalies associated. Another study of the micropulse was done in children under 16 years of age with the recurring glaucoma Half of them was diagnosed as a primary congenital, and these cases followed by you know uh, 15 months after the surgery, and uh, they found that the mean LP dropped significantly to nearly 40 percent. Qualified success is about 60 percent, not as much you know different from others, and uh, yes, most of the cases required second treatment. Another thing that we have to be, you know, be in mind is the SLT because SLT is very least invasive. Can it be done in the children at all enough to comply with the physician um, with, with the physician instructions? I think um, they can do it, and uh, some of the case reports shows that the SLT can, uh, you know, give the sorry, give the um, the February favorable results in these in this reports, just like, you know, four to five weeks after the laser done. But anyway, please be notified again. The gonioscopic uh, examination reviewed grade four in both cases with rare pigments and rare PES. We found the same thing in our cases with the eight years old boy who was diagnosed as a steroid-induced glaucoma after a long run of the steroid eye drop for, that, for his severe allergic conjunctivitis. He was referred to us with a, you know, uncontrolled IP in his right eye, even though with the MTMT, and uh, was referred for the surgical intervention consideration. But after we have discussed with himself and his mother in depth and at length, Finally, the SL10 was done in his right eye. And uh, interestingly, at one month, the IP dropped down to eight millimeter mercury, which is, I don't think it's just only that, you know, because we quit the steroids, uh, the, it should be the effect of the laser rather than that. And uh, later on, the medication was gradually reduced, and but because of his advance into his right eye, uh, the advanced glaucoma in his right eye, we can't, you know, give all those uh, medication away, which is fix him with a fixed comb. And after the 10 years passed by, uh, any other intervention had not been uh, done again and the IP can be well controlled. OCT, we have showed no progression at all. So if there are any laser treatment in children glaucoma, I would say that there is, of course, but that the consideration must be done whether you would do it after the multiple surgery failure or take it in consideration if, uh, for the primary, if the cases and the poor prognosis and the eye anomalies that high risk of hypotony or sort of things. So in summary, the laser treatment in childhood glaucoma can achieve up to 30% of IP reduction. The fake eye might be more responsive than other types. Most cases, always, I mean, most cases almost always need more than one treatment. The success of the IOP control can be you know, favorable up to two years, but after that, it will be declining drastically. SLT might be beneficial in juvenile glaucoma with normal appearing angle. And to my experience, I think uh, trabecular dysgenesis appearance might not be a good candidate for SLT. So that's all for now. And thank you very much for your kind attention. 
thank you thank you very much visani that was a very nice overview of the lasers for childhood glaucoma thank you and we move on to our next speaker that is dr ziolan zhang who is professor of ophthalmology and director of the clinical research center at zongshan ophthalmic center state ki laboratory of ophthalmology guangzhou china and she will be presenting the new technique of ab interno goniotomy that is gat for primary congenital glaucoma so over to you ziolan Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Yes, clearly. Very clearly? Okay. You see my beautiful face, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Professor Dada, for inviting me here. I would like to, let me see, give my laser point. Give me laser point. Laser point. Yeah, okay. Uh, I would like to share with you about GATT for congenital glaucoma. My name is Yuan Zhang, came from Zhongshan of Omi Center, Guangzhou, China. I would like to spend eight minutes to finish my talk and then four minutes for surgical uh, video for everyone. So I don't have financial disclosure. As you all know, angle surgery should be the first option for congenital glaucoma. Actually, he has a several name, trabeculotomy, gonioptomy, viscocalulostomy. He has ab internal and ab internal procedure. Slens canal is incised to very thin, 120 degree, 360 degree. And this presentation, I will focus on GATT. This is conventional trabeculotomy, ab internal, 120 degree gonioptomy. And this is a micro catheter, a 60 trabeculotomy map at external 360 degree. And GTT is a gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. It requires gonioscopy, high nominee, and eye chest system. And the cornea should be transparent to see angle structure. Uh, GATT needs good scale and fortune to perform. The indication of GATT, including primary congenital glaucoma, juvenile open angle glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma, secondary glaucoma. If you uh, perform in primary angle kosher glaucoma, you need to combine gonio nisis, we call GSL, and literature report that GATT has better results for mild to moderate stage glaucoma. For me, most of the patients are in advanced this, uh, stage, but the long-term result is still waiting for maybe 2.2 millimeter mean cornea incision, constrict their pupil, maintain anterior chamber with viscoelastic material, and insert the tip of microcatheter through the side pore incision. As well as the patient's head and surgical microscope to a proper position, assisted with gonioscopy to see the angle uh, clearly. Uh, to recognize the trabecular measure, it's the key. The slant canal is just behind the trabecular measure. The green line show you the trabecular measure and the white arrow show you the scale spur. See very clearly. Again, the purple one is the measure. The white one is white arrow. So it is the scale spur very clearly. So make the incision on the anterior wall of the trabecular measure to gain access to the stance canal we call gonioptomy. Then insert the distal tip into the uh, slant canal. In this step, the surgical hemorrhage is general. If breathing using viscoelastic material stop breathing and push the clock, if the uh, hemorrhage is a lot, you can aspirate. To make a 
make sure the microcatheter was always in the stent canal through visualizing the course of the uh, illuminated tip by turn off the light. The green arrow show the microcatheter pass around the canal uh, from the gonadal up to the side. See here. Then stabilize the distal tip of the microcatheter as it is see from the temporal incision and pull the uh, proximal portion of the catheter to complete the 330 degree trapezoidal lobotomy. As per read the uh, elastic, viscoelastic material, then all the procedure is finished. The complication including breathing, cornea endothelial injury, exfoliation of decimal membrane, injury lens, iris, the cilia body, and detachment of the choroid because of hypotony, and the IOP increase because they are steroid use. And in the long term, the agonious in care may be happening. Uh, if the breathing is too much uh, to see the slant canal, then aspirate first and elevate the IOP. What my experience, breathing is very common in adult advanced stage, but the baby eye is seldom breathing. GATD is a very simple procedure. If successfully, it only took five minutes to finish the surgery. However, if the microcatheter could not pass around the canal successfully, what should you do? Then we have a several ways to deal with. First, try MAP, app internal, or try app internal to find a way to pull off the tip if uh, the canal already if, uh, passed close to 230 degree. Please go to the APGS website to see my upload video. Third, you can try another way to insert the tip again. I will show you double 230 degree JTT after this presentation. I would recommend you before the surgery to check the angle structure, but I understand it is very difficult to check the baby eye. I will show you one special case with an abnormal structure of the angle when I do the uh, JTT. The third way is a tri map or another procedure. So, mix bring new option for the treatment of glaucoma. And GATT is a good option for congenital glaucoma. GATT is a simple procedure, few steps, less time consuming, and no damage to the conjunctival. So, it is worthwhile to be generalized. And surgical technique and pills are very close related to intraoperative and post surgical complication but the presentation just represent personal opinion. So thank you very much. I will show you the video. So, I will show you the uh, very special thing. Just the baby, I could not get angle. You need to find the angle is normal. There's no normal. 
Como os quatro degree but a 230 degree stop again don't move again made me crazy So a complete 330 degree trapezoidotomy is made through clockwise and anti-clockwise 230 degree trapezoidotomy. So thank you very much. I have done. <laughs> Thank you, Zilan. Thank you, Zilan, for uh, the video showing the excellent uh, technique of uh, GATT. Uh, Professor uh, Vijaya Lingam is not here. So the next speaker I will introduce is uh, Professor Shusmita Kaushik from uh, Chandigarh, India. She will be talking to us on post-operative uh, management. Over to you, uh, Shusmita. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fang. Thank you, Tanuj and uh, APGS and AIOS to give me the opportunity to talk about my babies. So uh, uh, there are no financial disclosures and uh, we've taken informed consent from parents of the babies to use their clinical photographs. So in the next couple of minutes, we'll uh, presume that congenital glaucoma has been treated with surgery. So one surgery done, what next? Uh, we look at when to call back, what to look for, how to evaluate, whether reway or sedation, and what disease progresses despite so-called controlled intraocular pressure in children. Uh, we would need to look at the cornea and the axial length. And even if the disease stabilizes beyond the intraocular pressure for these children, we need to look for their vision, their vision, and their vision. So the first thing is, when is the eye patch opened? So now that we've started doing bilateral surgery, and this is something which COVID has taught us, the child gets very, very annoyed when he wakes up from GA and has both eyes packed. So we open it three to four hours after GA. And actually what we've seen, this is just about three hours after surgery, and you see how much clearer the cornea is. And this is the, the ecchymosis from the speculum still there. So um, if it's unilateral, we usually wait till next morning. Uh, we look for the cornea, the anterior chamber, any high femur, and all of this will direct the next steps, usually of a combination of steroids and antibiotics for about three to four weeks. So what next? Um, in six to eight weeks, when the child comes back, the first thing we look for is the child's comfort. And the best thing to ask is the mother. So if you have a baby who was photophobic and unhappy and then wants to look at you through the slit lamp, you know most likely she's all right. And similarly, this kid who underwent a GAT actually, and this is next morning, and it's reasonably comfortable. So really, 
going to do angle surgery apart from the combined trap the trap we did has made a huge difference in the comfort of the children when we do that intraocular pressure if possible but we look at axial length very very carefully and we look at how we do that later so of course apart from the cornea we look at uh, the axial length and uh, intraocular pressure if we can do the eye care it's made a lot of difference but it's important to remember that in children a goldman apronation tonometer is the most accurate measurement for iop assessment rebound tonometry we must remember overestimates the intraocular pressure and the overestimation increases with increasing uh, central corneal thickness and increasing intraocular pressure so these are things to keep in mind but yet when you have a baby as small as this an eye care is your best bet so sometimes the iop is normal and that's when we look at axial length and it's important that the change is important not absolute values so we'll just look at this preterm baby with retinopathy of prematurity underwent both eyes lio and then required a lens sparing vitrectomy in this eye now post lsv had bufthalmos the problem was that the iop remained okay but the eye progressively enlarged so nothing really was done except give drops but despite that if you can see that now this is sampolysis chart which we use and this is plotted according to the age so you can see that when we saw this axial length was increasing beyond the normal growth and that's the caveat in children because the eyes are going to grow so you have to have a reference point against which you really measure the axial length so this is what we do in our clinic and then we did a combined trap the trap here because we saw the slope was beyond what normal was and then it stabilized and sometimes it does tend to go down regress towards normal as well so when would we start thinking of an eua when we think the pressure is high and one of the clues is the axial length rising more than the normal growth and look for loose sutures even if all else is okay and we think that's very very dangerous so for instance this baby underwent a goniotomy had a bit of high femur 6 weeks later looks all is well but if you look carefully there's a loose suture which is accumulating mucus and this needs to be taken up and requires an eua for just this and we've learned this the hard way this infantile pcg had a bilateral uneventful goniotomy could not come for 2 months because came from srinagar that's in kashmir due to the lockdown when they came back in 2 months the mother said the cornea looked whiter than before and that's why they came unfortunately the ultrasound showed choroidal detachment there was watering there was hypotony and to a horror when we put in a speculum and looked at it there was almost a corneal melt over there and it required a patch so we need to be really careful if we think the child is not going to follow up then maybe it's better to wait for surgery than operate and land up in a problem like this so far it's so good but we are keeping our fingers crossed now the follow up exams usually the first exam is planned 6 to 8 weeks after surgery if any intervention is planned we schedule them accordingly and if the examination is satisfactory then subsequent eua's or sedation are four monthly for the first year and subsequently we do it every six months and what do we look for we always compare it with the pre op status intraocular pressure corneal clarity corneal diameter again any sutures if there's a bleb if we did a trabeculectomy or a tube position if we did a drainage implant the disc status retina but what we've also learned is axial length refraction and keratometry and we do that at every eua because it's an opportunity to see how the eye is growing a word of caution in babies we need to explain punctal occlusion very very Uh, carefully and it's very important to wipe off the excess drug and we've learned that really hard way the 6 week old baby had a bilateral goniotomy done we usually use betamethasone four times both eyes but to a horror in 6 weeks this baby actually gained 6 kg 2 kg weight and when we evaluated the acth was low the cortisol was low and we had actually induced a cushing syndrome in just 6 weeks by just not probably explaining hard enough that the puncta need to be occluded and the excess drug needs to be wiped off as uh, dr sirisha had talked about secondary goniotomy so what do you do after trap the trap fails this is a right primary congenital glaucoma and left peters you can see the desmet defect underwent both eyes trap the trap the right eye seemed better but iop was not good enough 
So we did an optical aridectomy in the other eye since it was under GA, but a goniotomy for the nasal angle cleared the cornea and stabilized the pressure. So sometimes even if you can't do it at the first go, but second go, maybe the cornea is clear enough to do it. Now, it's also important to recognize the risks of repeated general anesthesia in these babies. There's a, early in life, there's attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, language processing and cognition. So it's not enough to just say, let's do UA three times a year or four times a year. So we evaluated an intranasal application of dexmedetomidine using an atomizer and a quick video to show that this little boy is actually fast asleep in the post-op recovery. So we do it in the recovery under monitoring. The patients are fasting as for anesthesia. This is the atomizer that's available. A little bit has to be just squirted in the nose. They don't need intubation. They just need one pulse oximeter to monitor them. And you can do most of what you want to do. You can see how the child is fast asleep. And uh, this is my senior resident who's going to go on with the entire EUA, including pressures and uh, diameters and retinal status and whatever you want to do. So we found this to be, uh, uh, to be a simple thing. After successful surgery in acute hydrops, for instance, if you have a, uh, an acute hydrops like this, and you do a combined surgery, and then you do a goniotomy in the left eye, the child is now four years old, IOP is fine, disc is stable. But is our job done? Beyond the pressures, we can't forget vision. Retinoscopy, spectacle prescription, visual acuity assessment, visual access assessment, amblyopia treatment, and when they're old enough, visual fees. So this is our cornerstone of actual glaucoma management. We are in the business of vision, so just controlling pressure is not enough. This baby underwent an OPK. This one had Peter's anomaly. OPK does bad. So we just did an optical iridectomy, and sometimes that is enough. Contact lenses are problematic. Remember, it's not easy. So when you have very high pressures, sometimes we need to do a refractive lens exchange which is a clear mm -hmm. lens extraction in this boy who had minus 22 in one eye. So to summarize, childhood glaucoma is a long term, a lifelong disease. It can manifest in myriad forms. So much is yet unknown, but ensuring good vision is our goal and not IFP control. But then we need to hold these children's hands for a long, long time. I acknowledge my seniors and my residents and fellows. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sushmita. That was really very comprehensive coverage for the post-operative management for penetric glaucoma. So, Sushmita, two questions for you. One is that, uh, what is your uh, protocol for doing occlusion therapy after you operate these children? And the second question is, what is the duration of post-operative steroids that you use after combined trabeculectomy with trabeculotomy? So usually these children are bilateral and occlusion therapy would depend upon what their visual status is. If it's unilateral, they all undergo occlusion therapy regardless of, uh, of what. So usually we start with at least four hours, partial occlusion. We don't give them full time because they get very, very irritated otherwise. And the pedic studies have shown that for moderate amounts of amblyopia, partial uh, occlusion or part-time occlusion is enough. But if it's uh, bilateral, then it is completely dependent on what the visual status after refraction and atropine retinoscopy is. Considering steroids, I usually, uh, it's about four times for about six weeks, and then it's a taper. But we've learned our lesson, and we are now going to really, really tell them to occlude their puncta because that baby was a real shocker for all of us. So we need to be careful. And Rishmita, once you see that the surgery is failing, then do you do a... A revision like a needling or do you go ahead and do a goniotomy? Secondary? No, I would. I would do, um, if I can see the angle, we've uh, started doing angle surgery more than anything. We do GAT as well. But uh, if we've done a combined trap with trap and I can see the angle, I would go ahead with a goniotomy. I would not like to touch the conjunctiva again. I don't think it works in children. But if at all, then probably we'll, talk, we'll think of a second trap or maybe a tube. Thank you, Dr. Shishpita. Thank you. So the next question is for Dr. Visani. Dr. Visani, uh, what is your experience with the micropulse for children? Um, we, we've got just only a few cases then with the, with the micropulse. Uh, I think uh, we just had a very short period of the follow-up. I would say that during the first few months, it works quite okay. But uh, 
but we have to look forward for, you know, for the longer term. In some cases, particularly um, the cases with the secondary glaucoma, seems that the IP just seems to rise up after, you know, after a few months. So I think uh, it perhaps it would take the same um, kind of, you know, algorithm just like other laser that they may need more than one treatment of, the, of those eyes. And uh, uh, the settings sometimes need to be adjusted because we don't still don't have many experiences with the macro cause in the children, but we are looking uh, at it uh, for a long way. Thank can, you, I ask, uh, can I ask Wisney uh, for the micro pulse? Uh, yes. Which, uh, which probe do you use? The is it the generation one or the generation two? Um, I think uh, we've got the generation one. I guess. Not yeah, sure. Because because the generation two uh, probe uh, is seems to be a bit better. And oh yeah. Uh, um. Sorry. So I think uh at the uh, first place we got. The newest one, so it's going to be the generation two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and I think Professor Paul Chu also have come up with the uh, MP3 plus uh, protocol. Uh, right. Which, uh, in addition to the micro pulse, I think he 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 actually advocate using uh, uh, ex additional shots of a uh, uh, slightly higher duty cycle. Uh, yeah, you call it the plus protocol, but I'm not sure whether in children whether is is. Uh, I, I I I I don't know, but because we, we just only have just you know uh, the kind of the uh, conventional setting one, but uh, but not with 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 that one. Just only if uh, I think we've got at the moment I got not more than ten cases that use the uh, the micro pulse. Uh, the rest of them with the conventional TCP or the ECP, yes. Okay. Thank you, Visani. We have a question for Dr. Ziulan. So, Ziulan, when you do the GAT procedure, what is the percentage where you can actually uh, catheterize the entire 360 degree? Or do you face obstruction in a, uh, a majority of cases, especially when the child is, say, below three months? So, Dr. Ziulan, are you there? So, I yes, Dr. Ziulan. How many how many patients I met uh, to two hundred thirty degree? You mean? So, are you how many patients are you successfully able to do a okay, okay, degree? Okay. How many patients okay. get obstruction in between? Oh. Uh, for my experience, most of the uh, patient can successfully to finish the 360 degree, but uh, just a uh, uh, coincidence happened. Uh, I think like uh, three to four cases could not move until 230 degree, but I never met the 160 degree, just 270 degree. No matter right eye or left eye, it's just really uh, it's it's a curious things. So so not much patient have that one. Why two hundred thirty degree, not a hundred eighty degree? Do you have that case? Yeah, one more question, Zivan. How many like you have a long term follow up for some of the GAD cases oh, no. because the the leaflets once you open up the leaflets of a tabacular meshwork, they tend to fuse back again over time. So have you seen a late post-operative rise in intraocular pressure after GAT? Okay, uh, because of GATT in China, only two years. The, the my patient, the most longer one is 202 months. Still really good result. So I didn't met really uh, uncontrolled IOP with my cases right now, but uh, for my experience, the children, the GTT is more successful than the adult. The, oh. Our patient, most of the patient is, is advanced stage because the uh, my or two moderate stage is goes to my clinical trial study. So most of them is advanced stage. But in my 
experience. We just doing the uh, retrospective study right now. I haven't get their result yet, but in my eyes, I think they use a one or two idea can control the IOP. I didn't see none of them. Okay. I didn't see none of them fail. Thank you, Dr. Shushmita. Are you using the endo illuminator or the suture for the GAT at for no, children? We, I, I, I think you are the only one who's lucky enough to have the <laughs> illuminated microcatheter right now. It's not marketed in India. So we use the fibroproline with the blunted tip. And uh, what I've seen, Tanoj, is that in uh, this leaflet fusing is more a problem when we do it in adults, especially combined with a FICO or something. But I intuitively think that in a growing eye, it's sort of, that's the same reason why a goniotomy would work in PCG and would not, would not work in primary open angle glaucoma. I think it's a growing eye. So the leaflets of the trabecular meshwork actually just grow with it. And uh, it saves us a second goniotomy for the nasal angle. So in the in in especially in the infantile ones, I'm very happy with it because it's easy. You can see the trabecular mesh work, and if you dilate it with visco before entering, even the proline works well. The only problem which I'm so scared of is that I don't know where the proline is going. So my heart is in my mouth until I see the end of the other. I said, Oh, thank God, it's come out. But that's okay. the only, only. But if there's an obstruction, we we stop. We don't. Uh, okay. Thank you. So I think we have had a very nice interactive session with the best surgeons of the Asia Pacific region, and I want to thank uh, our chairman, Dr. S. K. Fang, Dr. Visani, Dr. Sushmita Kaushik, who is the secretary of the Indian Pediatric Glaucoma Society, and Dr. Ziulan for that fascinating presentation on GAD. So I thank you all for uh, a very successful Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society Symposium and have a nice day and stay safe. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank yes. you. It's, my, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have thank a good you. day. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>